We are presenting today on program development for neurodiverse students in higher education. I'm Maggie Armstrong and I have my partners Caroline and Eric here with me and of course Dr. Lauren Milton just introduced herself as well. So thank you all for joining us today. We really appreciate you taking time out of your day to come listen to this project that we've been working on for uh, years for some of us at this point. Um, <clears throat> so I'm just going to go ahead and get started. At the conclusion of this session, participants will be able to understand the concept of neurodiversity, the current state of supports for neurodiverse students in higher education, and the role of occupational therapy in higher education. Participants will also be able to discuss outcomes of a program aimed at supporting students with neurodiverse needs in higher education. The development of the program will be analyzed using a logic model, which will include discussing resources and activities that went into creating the program, as well as the outcomes following the implementation of the program. So I'll just start off by defining what neurodiversity is. Um, neurodiversity is a social movement that views de developmental or neurological disabilities, such as autism spectrum disorder, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, and dyslexia as variations of the human mind rather than disorders. Using a logic model, this poster describes the modification of the support program for neurodiverse students called Project REACH. Project REACH aims to address self-advocacy, communication, and executive function for this population. Project REACH was developed by Dr. Kristen Gillespie Lynch at the City University of New York. If you have any questions about Project REACH, you can contact her at this email that you can find on the slide. So there's been an increasing number of neurodiverse individuals who are choosing to enroll in college following high school. For example, currently 44% of high school students with autism continue on to higher education. However, at four-year colleges, only 41% of neurodiverse students complete their degree compared to their peers' graduation rate of 52%. While there are many universities currently providing support services to neurodiverse students, there is limited evidence to support best practices. Some colleges have implemented support programs designed to assist this population, which often includes skills training and mentor support. However, the lower graduation rates of neurodiverse students is indicative of potential structural and content related issues within these programs. Currently, the development of these programs lacks standardized evidence-based guidelines, leading to a wide range in program design, curriculum, and implementation. Increasing the efficacy of these programs may increase the amount of neurodiverse students who complete their degree. And if we equip these students with effective supports while they're in undergrad, this could increase graduation rates to match their neurotypical peers, which can lead to an increase in neurodiversity representation in the workforce. So this is kind of the outline of what a logic model is. Um, it's a planning, evaluation, and, and implementation tool that visualizes the program development process. It considers the relationship between resources utilized, plan activities, produced outputs, and lasting effects, and how all these all work together to produce the ultimate goal. It also takes into consideration external factors and assumptions that may affect the program development. So our goal was to develop, implement, and evaluate programming to address self-advocacy, communication, and executive function skills for neurodiverse students in higher education. A few assumptions that we identified um, that we made during the program development process include that we assumed WashU students would be interested in receiving assistance for the chosen domains of self-advocacy, communication, and executive function. Second, we assume that the on-campus office for students with disability, disability resources would be willing to establish a partnership with us. A few external factors that affected program development process. First, our geographic location. This in-person program was only available for students on the Danforth campus at WashU. Secondly, we attend a research intensive medical school in which a lot of studies looking for student participants are conducted on campus. So here's a list of resources that we utilize during the program development process. Um, I'm just gonna highlight a few, which include Danforth's on-campus disability resources, which assisted us in our participant recruitment, 
Another major resource that we utilized was our content expert, Dr. Gillespie Lynch, who is actually joining us today. So thank you for uh, attending this. We really appreciate it. Um, and she gave us feedback on our program adaptations. Additionally, we utilized previously developed program content and materials, which we adapted to meet the scope of occupational therapy, as well as, as, well as the needs of our student population. So here are a few activities that contributed to our process, which included a literature search to increase our knowledge and understanding of the efficacy of current existing college programs. Another activity included the development of assessments to evaluate participants' experience within our program. And we also created recruitment flyers and emails for our participant recruitment process. So this just kind of outlines um, how we ended up selecting Project REACH. So during the program selection phase, we searched current literature to find evidence-based programming for neurodiverse students in higher education. We collected information on these various programs, including each one's purpose, goal, design, assessments, and results to compare to our own program needs. After consulting with disability resources, we selected Project REACH. The original Project REACH included the use of peer mentors as well as a semester-long curriculum. However, for the purposes of this initial programming run, we adapted the format to a nine-week pilot program without peer mentors. So this slide further details our collaboration with Dr. Gillespie Lynch. After establishing contact and re receiving approval to adapt Project REACH to our needs, we communicated via email and virtual meetings to collaborate on program content adaptations and to get feedback on the assessment, develop assessment methods that we ended up developing. So for the development of the curriculum, we had to consider multiple questions. So which topics are within OT scope of practice, which topics address the needs of the students, and which material, materials are already available. So through literature searches and consultations with content experts and key stakeholders, we developed a nine-week curriculum divided into three modules. So weeks one through two would be part of module one, self-advocacy. Weeks three through five would be part of module two, communication. And weeks six through nine would be part of module three, executive functioning. And one hour long meetings would take place one time per week. So after developing the curriculum, we had to develop assessments that would appropriately measure self-perceived levels of self-advocacy, communication, and executive functioning. So quantitative and qualitative assessments were de developed for each of the three modules, and these would be administered at the beginning and end of each module. So the resulting pre-test and post-test results from each module would be compared to determine if there were any self-perceived changes in self-advocacy, commu communication, and executive function skills. So the quantitative assessments consisted of a statement such as, I can define neurodiversity, I am comfortable with introducing myself and meeting new people, and when I plan out my day, I identify priorities and stick to them. And these statements were followed by Likert scale frequency options ranging from never true to always true. So the participant would select one of these options in, or, in order to indicate their ability and comfort, comfort level with the previously stated skill. So for the quantitative assessments for module one, self-advocacy, there were 10 questions for de defining neurodiversity, stating opinions and asking questions, and listing and requesting accommodations. For module two, communication, there were 15 questions that covered various skills, including conversation, nonverbal communication, and resolving disputes. And then for module three, executive functioning, there were 10 questions that covered things from planning to organizing and attention. And all of these quantitative assessments were adapted from existing measures.
sorry, I was muted. Um, but thanks, Eric. Um, I want to briefly touch on the qualitative assessments that were used and or the focus of my end of this research project. So these assessments were developed with pretty heavy collaboration from both Dr. Kristen Gillespie Lynch um, and her participatory research team. That's a team of graduate students and researchers with autism. Um, they were able to contribute uh, to the development of my qualitative questions, of course, along with my own research partners here. Um, in the end, we decided to also keep the qualitative assessments divided by module in order to best see the immediate effects of each topic. We also created a final questionnaire for the purpose of programmatic feedback. So module one on self-advocacy consisted of seven questions on topics of neurodiversity, why you would or would not disclose your disability, and how you would disclose to various types of people. Um, module two on communication had four questions to assess students' understanding of entering conversations, reading body language, engaging in disagreements. Module three on executive function had just three questions to assess students' ability to write SMART goals, organize a schedule, and manage stress. I'll explain a little bit more about SMART goals later. And finally, our programmatic feedback questionnaire had eight questions that were asking about perceptions of the program, um, what they liked and didn't like, what they would like to see more of, um, and what's the greatest thing that they gained from the program. And this was important to us in order to inform future iterations of the program, and we're hoping to be running this again in the fall. So now that we have gone more in depth with the activity pieces, we can move forward to our outputs. I'm not gonna read these all to you, but some of the more important items um, to note here include our nine PowerPoint presentations we adapted or developed to cover each week of our program, um, the activity-based teaching materials to go along with these, assessments that we just discussed, a lot of various recruitment materials that we used, um, and the fact that we ended up having two participants with a 100% retention rate, and our acceptance for a short course at AOTA conference for this spring. Okay, Eric, Caroline, and I are now going to give you some more details on the format of each week of our program, um, presenting the weeks that we personally led with posters that were originally created for use at that AOTA conference. So I began our program by leading the first two weeks on neurodiversity and self-advocacy. Um, week one, our goal was to introduce the program, um, get to know each other and our expectations while learning what neurodiversity is and um, our different group members' experiences with it. For this week, we did activities such as um, writing group expectations together, an icebreaker activity that helped to bring up the topic of neurodiversity, um, watching video of a person with autism describing neuro neurodiversity. And we ended the session with a think, pair, share activity to discuss strategies to start the school year with since this was at the very beginning of the semester. Week two, we discussed everyone's understanding of what self-advocacy is and relevant laws that provide these students with rights. So self-advocacy being a student's ability to kind of like stand up for themselves, um, state what they need and what they would benefit from. We engage in a drawing activity and introduce students to the Autism Self-Advocacy Network. Finally, we took some time to talk about disclosures, its pros and cons, and practice some role plays. During the session, students ended up asking for more information on reasonable accommodations um, for school and work. So we worked to provide that as well, and we ended up following up the next week with some additional information. After this, we began the communication module, module two, that Caroline's going to go into, but I came back for week six to lead our discussion on SMART goals at the beginning of module three on executive function. So SMART goals is just a format of writing goals to make sure that they're more achievable. Um, it's an acronym that stands for specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and timely. 
Um, so during this week, we introduced the idea of procrastination and the difficulty of meeting deadlines. We had them write out a goal to be completed by the end of the semester. And then we walked them through the process of writing this goal in that SMART format using a SMART goal worksheet. So my module focused on communication and interpersonal relationships. Week three centered around initiating and maintaining conversations in various environments. Uh, students shared strategies that have worked for them in the past, and they also identified new strategies that they could potentially try during the upcoming week following our module. Activities included brainstorming ways to meet new people on and off campus, discussing the appropriate application of small talk, and role-playing initiating, maintaining, and leaving conversations. Week four focused on nonverbal communication, including how to read and respond to body language and micro expressions. Students discuss various, various examples of body language and how it relates to conversations, mood, and nonverbal communication. Activities included watching a video about body language and micro expressions and role playing varying body languages to feel how body positioning may reflect what someone is thinking or feeling without them actually saying it. Our topic for week five was resolving disputes. Students identified ways to resolve disagreements while maintaining a positive relationship with others. Activities included analyzing scenarios in which conflict resolution is needed, practicing conflict de-escalation with peers and friends, and group discussions on effective strategies to communicate a disagreement while reducing tension. So weeks six through nine were part of module three, executive functioning and week six about SMART goals was just covered by Maggie. So week seven's topic was productivity. So we discussed productivity strategies, including scheduling tasks and events with an electronic calendar and designating daily time slots for homework. Um, these are strategies that students had tried in the past and we reflected on why they had or hadn't been successful. We learned about strategies that are utilized by productive students and workers, and we then practice a couple of these by applying them to the upcoming week. Week eight's topic was attention. So we discussed the different forms of attention, the potential for mindfulness to contribute to improvements in attention, and mindfulness techniques that have been utilized by these students in the past which include meditating using a mobile app and listen, listening to or performing music. We practice different techniques and identified local and online resources that can help facilitate mindfulness. And then finally, week nine's topic was stress management. We discussed the different forms of stress and how high levels of stress can negatively affect the body and mind. We identified positive lifestyle changes, including diet, sleep, exercise, and leisure as stress management techniques. Additionally, we learned about evidence-based study habits because the students were in the midst of their final exams. So a common theme for weeks seven through nine, as well as the program as a whole was self-awareness. So we emphasized the importance of knowing oneself trying or customizing these strategies and techniques, reflecting on why they were or weren't working. Um, so we facilitated reflection by starting off each meeting with a review of the previous meeting and discussing the strategy, strategies and techniques that had been implemented since the previous week. So through the development and implementation of Project REACH at WashU, there were notable outcomes for both us as the researchers and the students as the participants. So the researchers facilitated the creation of a support network by connecting the participants to other neurodiverse students. The researchers gained an understanding of the program development process and improved interprofessional communication skills by collaborating with content experts and key stakeholders. The participants created their own support network through their participation and willingness to connect with or, uh, other neurodiverse students. And they also showed signs of improvement in their self-perceived uh, self 
advocacy, communication, and executive function skills. And by developing and Im implementing Project REACH at WashU, we supported the role of OT in higher education and the efficacy of support programs that could potentially contribute to higher graduation rates and improved academic outcomes. So for this research project, I primarily focused on the quantitative measures and descriptive statistics whereas Maggie primarily focused on the qualitative measures and results. So the following slides will describe the results from the first trial of Project REACH at WashU. The descriptive statistics slides contain results from the quantitative measures. For the bar chart, the pretest score is in blue and the post-test score are in red. And these are provided for each question of the modules quantitative measure. The pretest mean is the average of the pretest scores, and the post-test mean is the average of the post-test scores. So as I mentioned earlier, quantitative assessments consisted of a statement on a skill, and then uh, like your scale frequency options that the participant would select in order to indicate their ability and comfort level. So a score of one would indicate never true, two is rarely true, three sometimes true, four is often true, and five is always true. So for module one, self-advocacy, participant A had relatively high scores at pre-test with a slight increase on average at post-test. So this indicates that participant A had relatively high self-perceived abilities for self-advocacy skills before the module, yet they still experience a slight overall improvement by the end. And out of all of the three modules, participant A's highest mean pretest and post-test scores were from this module. And then participant B demonstrated the greatest self-perceived improvement for question eight, which is about their ability to state academic accommodations guaranteed to them by the law. Okay, for qualitative results for the first module. So because we ended up having only two participants, we did find it more valuable to focus on the post-test results of the individuals in order to understand their knowledge at the end of the program. Um, both students demonstrated a really great understanding of what neurodiversity is, um, stating, you know, people have different brains with different strengths and weaknesses. Mankind's neurological makeup is diverse and the presence of multiple mind, minds and abilities. So those are some two great definitions for us. Um, when considering questions on self-advocacy, we saw a pattern surrounding trust and understanding with others, um, as well as a student's need. Um, so students desire to disclose their disability if they wanted to build greater understanding between themselves and someone else. Um, but not if they didn't trust that individual. They also did not want to disclose unless they thought it was going to help them succeed in work or school. So for module two, communication, participant A demonstrated the greatest self-perceived improvement for question two about knowing appropriate times to enter a conversation. And out of all three modules, this participant's lowest mean pretest and post-test scores were from here. However, by comparing the difference between the mean pretest score, or sorry, the mean post-test score and the mean pretest score for each respective module, participant A demonstrated the greatest self-perceived improvement on average from this module. And then participant B demonstrated the greatest improvement for question eight about being aware of another person's body language and question 11 about being comfortable in social situations. And out of all three modules, this participant's highest mean and pre-test and post-test scores were from here. So looking at their qualitative response, both participants demonstrated really great understanding of body language and how to use it to enter a conversation or gauge interest during that conversation. 
for example, one student said um, that people are interested in the conversation if their body is turned towards me, if they nod in agreement, if they're using eye contact, if they're smiling, et cetera. These answers show us that at the very least, students have a conceptual understanding of how to use and interpret body language. Students also demonstrated understanding of how to resolve disagreements through compromise and active listening. Interestingly, participant B had um, scored more poorly on their post-test quantitative questions for this particular topic than they did on their pre-test questions. Um, however, they had a much more thorough um, written response that really demonstrated competency here. Um, so we, again, we see that um, conceptual understanding, but perhaps they lack confidence in that understanding. And for module three, executive functioning, participant A demonstrated the greatest improvement for question three, which is about breaking down larger tasks into subtasks and timelines. And participant B demonstrated the greatest improvement for question one about identifying priorities and sticking to them. Question two about focusing on the most important tasks when there's a lot to do, and question four about completing these prioritized tasks by the end of the day. And out of all three modules, participant B's lowest mean pretest and post-test scores were from here, but if you compare the difference between the mean post-test score and the mean pretest score for each of the respective modules, this participant demonstrated the greatest improvement on average from this module. Great, so qualitative responses for module three, I have split up by participant, um, which I'll explain more in the next slide, but participant A demonstrated strong executive function skills in each of these three domains, um, showing how they would uh, structure a schedule, write a complete SMART goal, and discussing how they would manage stress now. For participant B, we ended up not getting post-test results for this module. You know, I want to be clear that neurodiverse students face challenges, obviously, that this program is hoping to address, but those are still going to affect the program itself. Um, the student was unable to attend our final session due to studying for their finals, and obviously that schoolwork is going to come before our program. Um, they were also less receptive to the format of filling out surveys via Qualtrics, particularly when they were more busy or stressed out by school. Unfortunately, we did see in their pretest results that this was a large area of struggle for the student, um, saying that I can't think of anything reasonable for SMART goals and for scheduling, I have no clue, shows a pretty big sign of distress for this area. Um, Anecdotally though, we did see a strong participation and increased sense of support from this individual during our sessions. We just don't have any formal qualitative results to support that. And the students was still verbally expressing stress um, to manage their final exam schedule. We would recommend that future programs work to ensure that their programming ends before the final exam season starts to help mitigate stress. Um, and consider alternative um, or multiple ways of collecting data. Finally, I want to provide a bit of the programmatic feedback we received from our other participant. So this person was really drawn into our program in order to meet more people on the spectrum and found great value from that support of others in this group. They also felt that they learned some valuable strategies from us and wished that we had had more time to talk about time management specifically. Videos and discussions were felt to be the most engaging um, and information like this is really valuable to us uh, to consider when developing a program, particularly for adult learners to ensure that we're meeting their needs and desires. We hope to use this information, like I mentioned before, um, to strengthen our own program for its next iteration in the fall. And with that, Caroline. 
So um, I just want to say that all three of us learned a, a great deal about program development and how to support neurodiverse students throughout the development and implementation of this program. Uh, we'd like to acknowledge the assistance and support that we received from our mentor, Dr. Milton, for guidance in this project from start to finish. We'd also like to acknowledge Dr. Kristen Gillespie Lynch for her collaboration and expert advice, as well as Heather Stout at Disability Resources for helping us establish a partnership with the Danforth campus. We'd also like to acknowledge the contributions and feedback from the Innovations and Education Lab at WashU OT program. Uh, thank you all for making this research project um, and program a possibility. We really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. So if anyone has any further questions or feedback, um, please feel free to reach out to Maggie, Eric, or myself. Um, here's our emails uh, listed right on the slide. What questions? <laughs> Anyone with a question, feel free to unmute yourself and ask the group a question. Will this was this recorded so that we could watch it later? I have had a very disruptive uh, attendance here, so I would love it to is. see the parts that I missed. Absolutely, yes. Um, good, any good news. Thank you. We'll be able to share it with um, family and friends. Absolutely. Very good. Thank you. I'll reserve my questions for Maggie later because I've been a poor <laughs> participant. <laughs> okay. I have a question um, for Maggie and Eric, and it's really more of a, a prompt. If you will share with the attendees what your plan is for moving this program forward? Yeah, so for the people that aren't from the ROT program, we have an experience called our DEC, our doctoral experiential component, coming up in the fall where we get to um, design learning opportunities for ourselves, essentially. Um, and we're going to be working to implement this program again through as part of that um, programming for ourselves. Um, so in towards the end of June, we're going to be looking at redoing some IRB um, approval and recruiting new participants, um, things like that, and then hopefully and um, making our adaptations to the program based on uh, what we've learned. And then hopefully we'll start straight back up with this again in September. Yeah, so as Maggie said, hoping to make those improvements from our experiences and the feedback from the participants. So making things as engaging as possible mm -hmm. and, you know, as well as recruiting more participants and hopefully making the program almost a mainstay on uh, Danforth campus. We also have some preliminary interest from past participants in being a peer mentor for the next iteration. So hopefully that works out for us. I have a question for Maggie and Eric as well as you're looking to continue this. Um, will you be focusing again on students at the Wash U campus or are you envisioning um, potentially expanding it out to other college students within the, the region? What's your plan for the fall? So I think we'll, we're still working on developing that plan. Um, definitely the easiest thing to do is to stay at WashU, but I think it'd be great for us to explore all of our options there. Um, and if we know anyone who wants us to come somewhere else, that'd be great fun for us as well. <laughs> it's a really fantastic presentation. I loved how you guys organized it and described the process. Um, Two questions. One is about executive functioning. Is that something that we've struggled with as well? And it seemed like that was something that you, you ran into some challenges with. Do you have any specific ideas for how to promote executive functioning more effectively in the future? And second, if, if things end up being online in the fall, you could <laughs> potentially develop this as an online module, which would change things a lot. 
but it would also allow you to recruit more people potentially. So, so our reach has gone online, of course, this term. And we noticed like a pretty strong drop off in people, but like a core group of people that have been persistently involved and, and the conversations have changed a lot in the way that it um, happens online. And I think the structure that you've developed could work really well to help people maintain a, a sense of consistency if things are online in the fall. Yeah, I think we're definitely going to have to work on coming up with our online contingency contingency plan. Um, I would have loved to have more time to plan an online programming, but obviously the need exists now. So we're going to have to do our best with that for sure. Um, Eric, do you have any ideas for the executive function? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot that goes in, like th that comprises executive functioning. So you know, it can be a very challenging um, topic to pinpoint where difficulties and areas improvement can be. But I think as we as um, program leaders get more experience working with students with various neurodiverse needs, that we'll see what areas of improvement are common and which strategies or techniques can be most beneficial and um, customizing and implementing them to the best um, interests of the students. And on top of that, also, we could consider finding ways to make more objective measures for um, assessing executive function skills. So instead of these self-perceived measures, if there are other ways that we can implement objective assessments into the program. Mm -hmm. I'm also just thinking that anything we can do to increase practical practice of their skills is, uh, I think would be a strong benefit. So what we didn't do was we actually like work with students on how they are planning out their schedule for their final exams of how they're gonna study. Um, it's a simple, well, just little things like that, I think, could be added to our program to really help the students out. And like, I think we made it clear that it is a learning process overall and that the, the reality is that there will be struggles and um, to at least try different strategies and techniques to see um, what is effective. And if they're not effective, um, reflecting on why they might not be and potentially using that critical reflection as um, ways to find out um, more effective strategies in the future. I also just wanna add that currently there is um, some evidence to support online programming for like as an intervention for this population. And so as long as we work to make it um, engaging because I think that's where we might lose them would be the attention on the online programming modules um, but it is currently supported by some evidence that um, I found so I think it's definitely potential and I think that that could be good just to carry over some consistency consistency for this population. Carolyn I'm glad you chimed in and I, I wanted to um, ask you as well you know, as an MSOT student who came on board with these um, two OTD students, um, what are your what was what are your main takeaways from, from doing this project? My main takeaway was how hard it is to implement a program, even one that like we we took project reach and then adapted it, and that alone was difficult um, just to get it going and to find people to participate, and then overcoming the skills that we're trying to teach this population or like help improve in this population. Um, I just found it, uh, I didn't think it would be as hard as it was. And I was only there for two years of this and they'd been doing it a year before me, like working on this project. So a lot goes into it. And then by the time that we implement and then close out the program from the fall and then disseminate the results and then write the paper, it's like already, a year or two passed when we did it. So 
just a long process is my main takeaway for program development. Yeah. Hi, Hi everybody. Can I oh, ask you. a question? Absolutely. Thanks, Hannah. Okay. Hi, y'all did awesome. I loved your presentation. I just, um, I love that y'all gave your participants an opportunity to share their experiences and um, kind of like tell you what they liked. I wanted to know um, what y'all thought, like if you could do it again or if you could add to this program, what would you want to add? Um, and kind of how do you see that going? Like, you know, you do a program, you see how you can meet different needs and if you would add anything to this program in the future. I personally would love to add the peer mentor portion that um, the original Project Reach does. I think that's super valuable and it's really supported in the evidence that um, peer mentors are like one of the most effective intervention strategies for this population. So I really think that if we were able to recruit um, people who are neurodiverse to be those mentors, I think that could be um, really helpful for the engagement portion and um, uh, improved outcomes for this program. Carol and Maggie and Eric, this is Heather, and I just wanted to say how exciting it is that the, the two individuals that participated in your program are just that, are willing and very interested in continuing to work with you as that in that role of the peer mentor. So congratulations, I think that speaks to how powerful this has all been and, and may continue to be as it, as it moves into the fall. Thank you. Yeah, that's definitely the area that I see it being able to grow in um, by word of mouth <laughs> and these participants seeing value in what they experienced and wanting to contribute to the project themselves. And something that I would like to add would be finding a way to implement topics that the students are interested in. So if there's a way to receive feedback before the project reach starts for the semester and seeing what topics they're interested in, um, I feel like that would be a good way to not make it or not only make it more engaging but to make it more relevant um, to their preferences and needs. Yeah. Logistically the timing for us as students makes it so when we need to plan the program is we don't have our participants yet um, and it would be great if we could figure out a way to talk to our participants to uh, adapt the program more specifically to them so that each semester that it's run, they get to choose what they're learning about more specifically, for sure. Awesome, thanks guys. Any additional questions for our presenters today? If not, we'll go ahead and wrap up. I do want to thank um, Heather Stout and Kristen Leslie Wrench. Thank you so much for your guidance through this process. Um, I, as their mentor on the ground with them at WashU, I very much appreciate your time and your expertise that you contributed um, to them and the support you provided this group. Um, so thank you so much um, for, for that.